The greatest supercar ever conceived and utterly stunningly, jaw-droppingly brilliant are both phrases that were uttered to describe just one car, the Bugatti Veyron. When it launched back in 2005, it was unlike anything that had ever come before it, being both the fastest production car the world had ever seen and having a degree of opulent luxury that put even a Rolls-Royce or a Maybach to shame. Unsurprisingly then, when it launched, it proved to be a bit of a big deal, immediately becoming the ultimate aspiration for petroheads the world over and earning itself the lead place in the zeitgeist of motoring enthusiasts, one from which it has yet to be dethroned still to this very day, despite the fact that faster cars have since come along and left it in the dust. Such was its vast cultural impact. And today we're going to get to grips with that legend by diving headfirst into the history of both Bugatti as a mark and the Veyron specifically, and then moving on to look at its insane design, performance, and impact on the motoring world. So let's jump in. The story of Bugatti, a mark synonymous with unparalleled automotive artistry and engineering prowess, began with the Bugatti family, one for whom artisan craftsmanship ran in their blood. Specifically, it began with Carlo Bugatti, a handyman whose beautiful Art Nouveau furniture, jewelry, and musical instruments made him a legend at the close of the 19th century. The household he founded with his wife Teresa was naturally quite the nurturing environment for a young creative mind, and sure enough, when his firstborn son, Etour, came into the world in 1881, it wasn't long until the young lad found himself fancying to follow in his father's footsteps, something Carlo was naturally chuffed to bits with. But as he fettered and tinkered at a young age, the young Ator soon found that his interest lay not in the wooden, but in the metallic, specifically the mechanics and engineering of automobiles. From there, he tinkered further and began converting pedal-powered bikes and tricycles into motorized vehicles. This sparked all the joy that young Ator could ever want, and he knew that he had found his calling. Motorized bikes could only scratch his itch for so long, however, and so in 1909 he founded Automobiles e Bugatti. Under its war's leadership, Bugatti went on to produce a dizzying array of vehicles that were as much groundbreaking works of art as they were masterstrokes of engineering, with highlights being the 1903 Type 5, the 1924 Type 35, 1927's Type 41, and the 1934 Type 57. His financial fortunes came and went over the years. It all was an artist, not a businessman, as far as he was concerned, and so long as the bailiffs were beating his factory door down, he cared not for his bottom line so long as he could keep producing beautiful cars. Unfortunately for him, World War II threw a spanner in the works. You see, Etour was Italian and his factory was in France, and that was a problem. The French government was none too happy about having an enemy national running about on their soil, and so operating his business became nearly impossible and production ground to a halt. After the war, Etour's health declined, and he passed away in 1947. The company struggled to regain its footing after this. It made the Type 73 and a few variants thereof, but failed to shift many units, even by the company's old modest standard, and so with no leadership, no customers, and no money, it just shut up shop and closed in 1952. A few attempts were made to revive the brand in the following decades, but none of these were successful, and the Bugatti name lay dormant. The most notable, and certainly most exciting of these attempted revivals was under Italian businessman Romano Aratol in 1987. He bought the rights to the Bugatti name and began development of the EB110. Work actually finished on the car, which thanks to a quad-turbocharged V12 engine that put out 603 horsepower, could it top speed of 221 miles per hour and do 0 to 60 in 3.1 seconds, a simply monstrous figure for the time. But unfortunately, while the EB110 was a mechanical marvel, it was a financial disaster. Not nearly enough orders came in to break even, never mind make a profit, and so the company went bust again in 1995 with only 134 EB110s having been produced. From there, the Bugatti name slipped back into nothingness. If the Bugatti name was to be revived and actually thrive, one thing and one thing alone was needed. Money and a lot of it. But luckily, what would you know it? Right around the time Aratol's effort went belly up, there just happened to be a German automotive giant that had earned a fortune from pumping out largely uninteresting and drab econo boxes for decades, which was gobbling up all the exciting car brands it could get its hands on in an attempt to seize the performance car market for itself 
And that, of course, is Volkswagen, who bought Lamborghini, Bentley, and Bugatti all just in 1998. In Volkswagen's vision, Lamborghini was to be their brand for the new money. Bentley was going to be their brand for the new money they wanted to look like old money, and Bugatti oh, was to be the brand for the big money. Those for whom money was no object and who demanded the best. But just how do you make the best performance car? Well, that's pretty simple. You make the fastest one. Work would begin on what would become the Veyron almost immediately, and before 1998 was even out, the again newly refounded Bugatti had begun work on a collection of concept cars, uh, which we're showing you on screen now. For all their differences, however, they had two things in common, all-wheel drive and a whopping great W18 engine. We didn't misspeak there, yes, it had 18 cylinders. The first unveiled was the EB118, a luxurious two-door coupe at the Paris Motor Show in 1998. That was followed by the EB218, a four-door sedan introduced at the Geneva Motor Show in 1999, which was then followed by the 18.3 Chiron, a mid-engine sports car at the 1999 Frankfurt International Motor Show. In October 1999, a fourth concept car, the EB184 Veyron, was presented at the Tokyo Motor Show, featuring a mid-engine layout and styled by Bugatti's own team, under Hartmut Warkus. By 2000, a more refined model of that final concept, the EB164 Veyron, made its appearance at various auto shows, including Detroit, Geneva, and Paris. Sadly, though, viewers, we have to report a tragic turn in the story now. That mind-boggling 18-cylinder engine was now gone, replaced by a mere 16 cylinders still in the W arrangement. Despite the tragic loss of possibly the coolest engine that would have ever been crammed into production car, the 1614's announcement brought an end to the concept. The car had been selected for full development. Volkswagen gave the formal green light on development in 2001, with the work taking place in a brand new state-of-the-art facility in Molsheim, the ancestral home of Buga where Ettore made his beautiful rolling works of art all those years back. Things proceeded better than anyone could have expected, and the first drivable prototype was ready by August 2003. And as you can see on the screen, the final prototype EB164 looks very similar to the final Veyron that we know and love today. The similarities went more than skin deep too, barring a bit of tinkering here and there to optimize it for mass production. This, near as damn it, was the finished product. That tinkering took longer than expected, however, and the Veyron wasn't launched until September 2003. For its launch, it was also renamed, the prototype EB16-4 becoming the Veyron EB16.4, the Veyron prefix being a nod to Pierre Veyron, a celebrated Bugatti engineer, test driver, and racer who, alongside Jean-Pierre Vermille, clinched the 1939 24 Hours of Le Mans in a Bugatti. This was a clever nod to signify to the world that despite the VW cash behind the project, this was intended to be a true Bugatti, one reimagined for the 21st century. So now that we know its origin story, let's bring this chapter to a close and have a look Look at the insane design of the Veyron. How do you sum up the design of the Veyron? in a single word. Would it be madness? Would it be inconceivable? Both would be appropriate, as not only was it the fastest road-going car in the world, exactly as Volkswagen had intended, but never before had a car combined such absurd performance figures with such wanton and opulent luxury. Just look at these photos, and you can see what we mean. Here is the Dower 962 Le Mans, the car whose top speed crown the Veyron stole. And here is the interior of the Roof CTR, the car that the 962 pinched it from prior. Sure, the 962 isn't bad, plenty of leather going on and all of that good stuff, and the CTR isn't exactly Soviet either, but neither of them can hold a candle to this. Have a look past the hand-milled magnesium indicator stalks, the brushed aluminium center console, and the expanses of blemish-free Austrian leather and see if you can spot a single piece of plastic, because you'll be looking for a while. Now, opulence is great and all, but what of the speed? Well, courtesy of its 8-liter W16 engine, a masterpiece of engineering that is, to put it simply, two V8 engines banged together at the crankshaft to make a W16, which is then hooked up to four turbochargers, the Veyron puts out a frankly ridiculous 1,001 horsepower at the wheel. Because of this, despite weighing a rather portly 4,387 pounds, the Veyron can smash 0 to 62 miles per hour in 2.46 seconds and 0 to 124 miles per hour in 7.3. And 
0 to 249 miles per hour in 55.6 seconds. And it does keep going up from there to a top speed of 253.81 miles per hour. Now, these numbers are incredible, for sure, but what actually do they mean? How are we meant to get our heads around such numbers where most of us have likely never driven faster than 100 to 120 miles per hour or so? Well, we need some context. Let's begin by comparing the Veyron to some other supercars. Starting with the Dow 962 Le Mans that we mentioned earlier, this street-legal Porsche 962 race car is a beast to be sure, able to hit a top speed of 251.4 miles per hour and smash out 0 to 62 in a mere 2.8 seconds. I mean, this is great, but still doesn't actually really tell us very much. I mean, you probably hadn't heard of the 962 before this video, and thus you don't have a frame of reference. We need something we're familiar with. Ideally, something we've all driven on video games games or spent childhoods ogling out on old episodes of Top Gear. Something like the McLaren F1, which with its 6.1 V12 can hit a top speed of 240 miles per hour and do 0 to 62 in 3.2 seconds. Or the Ferrari Enzo, which thanks to its 6 litre V12 maxes out at 217 miles per hour and has a 0 to 62 time of 3.14 seconds. Please note, however, while some of these increases may sound minor, consider this to be further put into perspective here. If an F1 car and a Veyron a drag racing in a straight line, and the Veyron sets off when the F1 hits 120 miles per hour, the Veyron will still beat it to 200. Its performance is just in another league to everything that came before it. But now to really drive home the insane performance of the Veyron, let's now compare it to some slightly more humble motors, ones that, statistically speaking, there's a good chance many of you watching this own, specifically the Peugeot 208, Europe's best-selling car, and the Ford F-150, America's best-selling vehicle. Vehicle. The Peugeot 208, with its three-cylinder, one-liter engine, reaches a top speed of 101 miles per hour and accelerates from 0 to 62 in 14 seconds. In contrast, the Ford F-150, with a 3.3-liter V6 engine, has a 0 to 60 time of 7.6 seconds and a top speed of 180 miles per hour. The Veyron would be up to 124 miles per hour before they could even hit 62, and then it would keep on going, give or take, to double and a half their top speeds. It's simply beggars belief. All in all, however, the Veyron's performance is probably best summarized by the following quote by Jeremy Clarkson, the patron saint of internal combustion. Quote, a Bugatti Veyron is the most stunning piece of automotive engineering ever created. At a stroke, the Veyron has rendered everything I've ever said about any other car obsolete. It's rewritten the rulebook, moved the goalposts, and in the process, given Mother Nature a bloody nose. All in all, a nice round figure The 450 Veyrons were sold between 2005 and 2015, but this 450 was split between a number of different variants, with the one that we've been referencing so far being the standard Veyron, standard both by Bugatti's own marketing and by quantity. That's the Veyron 16.4. 252 of this variant were sold between 2005 and 2011, so now let's have a look at how many of the other variants were sold and learn a little bit more about them while we're at it. There was the Veyron Grand Sport, a target-topped convertible variant of the standard Veyron introduced in 2009. Its production was capped at 150, and it was exclusively available to pre-existing Bugatti customers. In total, 58 units were sold by the time its production ended in 2015. The Veyron Supersport, an even faster standard Veyron that had an increased power output of 1,183 horsepower and could hit a 2.4 second 0 to 62 speed and a top speed of 268 miles per hour, although it was limited to 258 miles per hour in normal conditions to prevent its tires from exploding. Production of this variant was capped at 48 units, with no limits being placed on who could order one. Finally, there was the Veyron Grand Sport Vitesse, a target-topped convertible version of the Supersport. Being a convertible, it was a bit more chill than its hard-top sibling, but still had the same engine, could hit 0 to 62 in 2.6 seconds, and reach 233 miles per hour, being electronically capped on account of its more floppy nature, being a convertible and all that. Its production was capped at 150 units and 92 were sold by 2015 when Bugatti ended its production. But what of the cost? How much did a Veyron set you back if you were or one of the customers lucky enough to get your hands on one? Well, Jeremy Clarkson, the oracle on all matters motoring himself, gave the figure at a nice round million dollars USD for a standard Veyron, both on a 2005 episode of Top Gear and in his Sunday Times column. Although this price varied significantly in real terms, as customization options could easily double the price if one went overboard, and in addition, later, fancier Veyron variants naturally cost more too. Exact figures for these ones are hard to come by, but it appears that by the end of production, a Grand Sport Vitesse would happily set you back a 
couple of million American dollars. And that was just the cost of buying the thing, as servicing and maintenance costs proved equally insane. For starters, everything from a fluid change up to a total rebuild after a high-speed accident could only be done in-house at an official Bugatti service center. Keith's, the garage down the road, was contractually not allowed to open the bonnet by Bugatti themselves as part of the ownership deal, even if he did feel brave enough to have a crack at it. Then there was the cost of the parts themselves, nearly all of which were highly intricate and specialized pieces made in small volumes by Bugatti as and when they were needed, so they did not run cheap either. As a result of all of this, a full fluid change, which Bugatti recommended doing once yearly, would set you back $25,000. A new set of tires, which was recommended every two years, would set you back $38,000. And a new set of wheels, which were advised to be changed every 10,000 miles, would set you back $50,000. Meaning that Aveyron would happily set you back $50,000 a year in just routine servicing. And God forbid you ever needed parts replacing as a new turbocharger would set you back $15,400, including parts and labor. And bear in mind, it had four of those. As for a new camshaft adjuster or fuel tank, that cost you $22,000 and $44,000 respectively. Surely though, with all these mad numbers, the Veyron has been a tidy little learner for Volkswagen. Right? Well, actually, no, not at all. At least at face value, anyway. Developing the Veyron, jam-packed with advanced top-of-the-line technology as it is, was a monumentally expensive endeavor costing $1.62 billion dollars, a figure that in light of the very small production volume meant that Volkswagen lost roughly six million US dollars for every Veyron that drove off the forecourt. So then why even bother buying Bugatti and making the Veyron at all? Volkswagen can hardly be accused of being foolhardy businessmen, so what was their logic? Well, admittedly, there was a bit of an element of Kennedy and doing it, not because it was easy, but because it was hard motivation behind the car. But despite this, there was actually some sound financial reasoning as well, but it was all about broader strategic objectives rather rather than immediate returns. For starters, a key idea was for the Veyron to spearhead the development of a vast pool of technological intellectual property, which would be then sat on a shelf ready to be used by the Volkswagen Group's more comparatively mass-market performance car manufacturers such as Lamborghini, Porsche, or Ferrari, and even with the hot versions of their more normal cars. Exact figures on just how much development money was saved by piggybacking off the back of Bugatti R&D is hard to come by. But as a flavor, Winfried Varland, who assumed responsibility of Škoda in 2010, is on record as saying that the Mark III Octavia VRS, released in 2013, had its development costs cut significantly by pulling from the Bugatti research back catalog. Moreover, the Veyron was also intended to serve as a halo car, a car that serves as a Mark's flagship model, and is so incredibly amazing and shiny that it lifts the overall perception of the brand and thus drive sales. To demonstrate, imagine you're back in the 2010s and you just happen to find yourself with a fancying for Volkswagen's new Scirocco. After all, it's a pretty good looker. But then you flick on your telly on a Sunday and you see Jeremy Clarkson and James May royally ripping it to shreds on account of the pathetic performance of its entry-level 2-liter diesel engine. Well, maybe that brutal mockery doesn't dissuade you quite so much anymore, because after all, they make the Veyron, so they must know what they're doing. To summarize, the Veyron story is one of strategic investment in brand prestige and technological innovation, with the understanding that some projects, particularly in the high-end luxury market, serve purposes beyond immediate profits. When all was said and done, the Veyron would only spend an initial two years as the world production car record holder for speed, as it was dethroned by the SSC Ultimate Aero in 2007, which hit 256.14 miles per hour. It did admittedly win the record back in 2010 when a super sport model smashed out a tidy 267.856 miles per hour, only to be dethroned again by cars such as the Hennessy Venom GT, which hit 270.49 miles per hour in 2014, and the SSC Tuatara, which hit an utterly insane 316 miles per hour in 2020. But for the Veyron and its legacy, the fact that it has long since been dethroned from the top spot matters not. It landed just at the right time to capture the imagination of the motoring world in a way that no later car has, and therefore it still is, and likely will always be, the supercar. 